El Segundo, we are opening our regularly scheduled city council meeting along with the special. We're opening those simultaneously this evening. The special presentations will be presented during the special meeting. And please note, the civil unrest update is now referred to as the citizens protest update. Council will begin the meeting with the first six items of the regular meeting agenda. Then we'll move to the special meeting agenda. And once we're finished, we'll continue with the regular meeting agenda. For item number eight, which is related to short-term rentals, written communication will be accepted up to the close of the public hearing at, and you're gonna email public communications at lsegundo.org. And the clerk is monitoring that email, that email address as we speak. And let's see, we've also invited some folks if they wanna speak in chamber, they can do so. But before we get started with tonight's meeting, we'll have the invocation tonight led by our very own uh, city clerk, Tracy Weaver, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by council member Nickel. All right, here we go. Dear Lord, as we assemble here this evening, grant us the gift of understanding that we may be kind and willing to work together. Graciously bestow upon us the gifts and abilities required for the work before us. We ask your guidance in our thinking during the meeting so that our knowledge may result in the growth and prosperity of our city. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councilman Nickel. Please stand, and if you can see a flag, uh, face it. If not, face the flag of City Hall. Right hand over your heart and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilman Nickel. Madam Clerk. Uh, may we have roll call, please? Absolutely. Council Member Giroux? Here. Council Member Nickel? Here. Council Member Perstock? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel? Here. And Mayor Boyles? Here. Thank you. Now is the time and place for public communications, both regular and. <laughs> should speak at this time. Madam Deputy City Clerk Schilling, is there anyone in chamber wishing to speak? You're muted. Money, you're muted. We have five members of the public that are wishing to speak tonight. The first is Elias Garcia. Hey there, it's a pleasure to see you all, even if it's, uh, you know, kind of distanced. Uh, by miles instead of just feet. Uh, so uh, I, I'm here to present, uh, we are El Segundo for Black Lives and you're gonna be hearing for a couple of us tonight. Uh, you might've seen some of our protests, uh, pretty proud of those. We've had quite a few people turning up uh, and we have around 660 people so far on our various social media accounts. Uh, I'm head of the social media accounts. So if you have any, have any, have any questions about those, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we are El Segundo for Black Lives at gmail.com. So yeah, you'll be hearing from us and you'll probably see your inboxes full of some of our members. Uh, unfortunately, we only gave them like an hour. So, you know, there might not, there might only be like 10 or 20, but uh, I, I think it'll show you some of the support that this community has for our movement and that we are to be taken seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how you guys doing today? My name is Keith Puckett. I'm here on behalf of El Segundo for Black Lives. Um, I've been an El Segundo resident for over 10 years. Um, the citizens of El Segundo support El Segundo for Black Lives. As part of the leadership for El Segundo for Black Lives, we look forward to working with the mayor, the city council, the El Segundo Unified School District, and Chief Whalen, and the El Segundo Police Department in turning our backs on our racist past and embracing our new future. I think, you know, there's been a lot of positive signs, I think, since the tragedy that took place in Minnesota. Um, you know, I think looking at city council, I, I definitely saw Lance, Lance's uh, speech. He's definitely moved by it. 
and uh, definitely uh, appreciate accepting uh, the racist past at El Segundo and looking forward to making some change and moving forward. There have been a lot of positive signs. We've been engaged with uh, Chief Whalen, who has uh, helped support, or not support, but make sure that our protests go off without any issues. And then the mayor, Drew Boyles, has also reached out to different people of the community and asked for their opinions on how things can get better. I think these are all positive signs, and I look forward to building this, building the bridge in the community and working with the city officials to, to make the changes that we're all looking to make. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Puckett. Good evening, council members. My name is Tamari Sobzai. I am an upcoming junior at El Segundo High School. Um, I've been a part of this district since kindergarten at Center Street Elementary. And today I come to you as a student, a leader, and a member of the organization El Segundo for Black Lives. Now, I love my school and my community and my teachers, and I'm grateful for this amazing district, which is why I feel the need to shed light on an important matter I see at school. The lack of diversity among staff is quite frankly appalling, and there's practically no representation for students of color. In the 10 years I've been with this district, I've had only four teachers of color, and none of them have been black. So today I wanna to talk about my experience as a person of color in a community where none of my role models or educators are look like me. Imagine this, me as a fourth grader on the first day of school. My teacher assigns us a project to draw a portrait of the person sitting next to you. So I look over at the boy who's drawing my portrait and I see him shading my face in with a brown colored pencil. And instantly I'm disgusted, embarrassed, and most of all ashamed of the fact that I'm brown and that he would color me with that pencil. I felt that in order to be beautiful and accepted in this community, he needed to replace that brown colored pencil with the white one. Now I fought against these emotions. I've grown into an independent woman who loves herself and her complexion but I'm on here, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the, um, the other little girls who feel this way and all the other students of color who, who feel as though they're not represented and who do not see enough people in power who look like them. So I'm standing up for them and I need you to stand up for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you. She got, yeah, she got an applause. You guys, I'm here so I could hear it in the background. Thank you. Hi, Amanda Touchton. Thank you, council members and Chief Whalen for taking the time to listen to our concerns. I am a parent of two students, one who's graduated and one who's currently at El Segundo High School. I am a resident, I'm a homeowner, I'm a small business owner, and I'm here to passionately advocate for this community to become leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement. We don't need to be followers. We have a small town. We don't need to live with the bureaucracy of larger towns. We can make real and lasting change. No student should ever feel the way that young woman, Samara, just expressed that she felt. There is no reason why this town cannot have more people of color in positions of power, more educators, more diversity, and this is something that we don't have to see as an attack on our police department. Chief Whalen has been nothing but professional at every step of the way. This is an opportunity to, for us to move forward, for us to improve, to, uh, for us to make our town a better place. That's what we're here to do, and we're hoping to work cooperatively with you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Robin Muscozzi, and I'm a resident of El Segundo, and my daughter goes to high school here. Uh, I thank you very, very much for listening to us today, and um, I agree and uh, appreciate the comments of those that came before me. Uh, personally, I'm very, very honored to stand with Black Lives Matter of El Segundo. I grew up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the only time we ever gave a thought to California was when there was an earthquake out here. 
But for some reason, the only other thing we knew about California was that if you were black and drove through this little town called El Segundo, you were not safe. I also heard this from a white longtime resident who recently relocated. I assumed when we moved here, things had changed. But after hearing residents' anger and disgust over uh, El Segundo's Black Lives Matter organization, even hearing from a lifetime El Segundo ex-cop, it strikes me that many in this town refuse to acknowledge not just the past, but their own unwillingness to acknowledge that past. Saying a past didn't exist or is no longer relevant can be an act of violent erasure. Violent because it is forced upon many citizens of this city who cannot forget and who still see that past broadcast loud and clear within the community. When present El Segundo residents make other El Segundo residents feel unwelcome and unsafe, it is the job of all city organizations, all of those servants of the public, to organize solutions to this unrest. I ask you take El, that you take El Segundo's past seriously, to publicly acknowledge this history, to make substantive promises and policy committed to both healing the hearts and minds of your constituents and proactively work to gain the trust of the black community that you are meant to serve and protect. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Pickhaver. I'm an El Segundo resident and I've lived in the South Bay for the last seven years. I'm a proud member of the group El Segundo for Black Lives and I wanna thank you for taking the time to hear our concerns this evening. It's my hope that city council listens to the leaders of this group to take concrete actions to enact changes to better protect black residents in our community. On social media, I'm seeing a lot of people say things like, our town is fine the way it is, or El Segundo doesn't need reforms. Those same people, to remind you, are members of our community, are also saying things like this. I think black people just like killing each other. Maybe they should take on more responsibility when having sex as the ramifications of a fatherless child. Find something else to do with your time and don't worry about others so much. The good news is that for every hateful and ignorant comment like this, there are plenty more comments of support along with so many people taking positive actions themselves to raise awareness and bring about change. However, these hateful comments from our neighbors, while hopefully only a loud minority, reveal that El Segundo is not fine just the way it is, and a lot still needs to be done. I hope you take the policies proposed by the group seriously and commit to making El Segundo a safer town for people of color. Thank you. Thank you. First, I wanna thank the everyone who's been on this journey with us regarding home sharing and short-term rental. Thank you. It's a long journey. I'm very happy El Segundo has decided to proceed with responsible home sharing. Proactive, effective enforcement is, the, is now required to make sure that we provide the financial opportunity for home share hosts and still protect our community, residents, and neighborhoods. None of this will matter. It is well written. It has all the things we want, but without proactive, effective enforcement clear clear laws that can be enforced not gray areas none of it will matter property owner and the city are responsible for managing compliance not the neighbors property owner is responsible for what happens on their property living on site do visitors stay this is this is this is wonderful this is critical but if a complaint is responded to the host must be present or available if not, no excuses, no stories. Property owner residents, 183 nights. What proof will be required? There was no discussion of that in the ordinance, in the regulation. There is best practices. Beware of ghost hosts. The people making a very significant financial gain off this will look for ways 
to get around the regulation. Occupancy limitation. Police and city staff must be able to enter the property. And we have seen in my experience with the Virginia property, the police said they're not allowed to enter the property to count people. Did you see how many? If someone is being a home share host, they must be allowed. Parties, events are now gatherings. Cities should stay current on new marketing tactics to avoid city guidelines across the country. Um, compliance and enforcement is key. And regarding what other people were talking about, um, there were there, we've been living with this for years. And when a large group of white young people were there, they're just having fun, they'll calm down. And we had a black and brown group there and there were six police cars attacking the house all of a sudden. And the owner of the property said, I didn't invite them. It's not my fault. I didn't, she was not fine. Property owner needs to be responsible and the city needs to enforce and issue compliance. Compliance is enforcement, regardless of who the property owner is, what the instance, please believe the neighbors and please just, because if, if we enforce the, the good responsible home sharing people will comply and we'll just get the ones out of the market that are not respectful of El Segundo, the neighborhoods and the laws that we pass. Thank you. Thank you, Mona Eisman. All right, that's um, it for public communications here at city uh, in the council chamber, Tracy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, Tracy, you're muted. I received a total of 29 written communications. So I would like to know if well, so of those 29, 22 of them are regarding Black Lives Matter, four for the Greenbelt, one regarding the plunge, and two regarding short-term rentals. Um, I can read, um, of, of those 22 for the Black Lives Matter, um, they're uh, pretty much all along the same similar lines. So I will read all of them for you if you would like, or I can read maybe five to six of them and I can tomorrow put them all together in a Word doc for you and send them to you. And they will also be posted to the website. I'm here for whatever you'd like me to do. I think, I think uh, summarizing them would be great. And then maybe on the 22, can you just read names? So I that we can, I, we can, but not necessarily the email, so we can indicate people we know and may want to connect with. And then if you can summarize or include all of them in one big document for us to review tomorrow and on the website as you mentioned that'd be great Tracy. sure i've written all of the names down i'd be more than happy to um to read them off to you of course you know i will slaughter some of these names but i'll do my best and um, Tracy, Tracy yes. can i interrupt sure. drew members yes, of the public that are here um, have stated that they're here specifically to listen to those communication and they are requesting if they be read. Okay, do you wanna, you wanna share it, Tracy, so you don't have to read all of them? That's a lot to read. Um, I can- Scott, what do you suggest, Mr. Mitnick? Um, hang on. I think if, if they want to read, if, if the residents are, uh, want to read, have their comments read, we need to read them. Um, if they've said, yeah, no, I'm saying like, how could we have, should we wrote, can we rotate? <laughs> Is there any policy against rotating? So Tracy doesn't have to read all 22. Oh, Mr. Hensley has a suggestion, city attorney. Are, I was just informed that, that these, are, are they just, are they like a form email? Are they all pretty much um, identical? Some are, yes. They're very similar. There's about 
Yes, they're very similar. Some are not, but yes. Um, it did state on our, we, we, we did say in the, in the absence of time that it, there is a possibility not everything would be, um, be able to be read out loud. We, we do state that on our agenda. What's the will of the council? Mr. Nichol. We have a total of 30 minutes for public communication. Let's see how many we can get to. Good and, idea. Uh, you know, to the point that many times groups will come to us for public comment and it's the, um, the volume of humans in the, in the room speaking to the same subject that tends to have an effect. And I think that's the desired effect here. And so yeah. I think we should give them their desired effect. Yeah, great idea. Okay. Um, would you like me to start with the ones that do not have to, so that you, that don't have to do with the Black Lives Matter movement? That way, at least those get read, and then I can move into the Black Lives you Matter. You said there were four related to the Green Belt. Are they yep. pretty much the same sentiment? Yeah, they're pretty much the same sentiment as Is the- Is everyone on council Matter. okay with, uh, and I, I assume that they're encouraging us to go for that MTA grant, similar email that correspondence that we've gotten. Is everyone on the council okay with not reading those public comments and getting those later in email? Yes. Okay, there's three. Okay, yes. So let's go on. There's one regarding the plunge. Okay, let's let's hear that quickly, please. All right. Dear Mayor and Council Persons, I believe there's an item on the agenda for the plunge in regards to the renovation of the plunge. I believe um, Muthian to be one of the better companies to help us design and plan for the future renovation of the plunge. I hope your shift is to improve the contract so that we can move forward. And that's from Lee Davis. Thank you. And then I have two from short term rentals, which I can wait if you'd like and read. Yes. During, um, yeah. Let's read those during public hearing. Yep. That's great. We do that. And now I also have um, not it pertains to the civil unrest it's one it's from a former police officer um did everyone get that e everyone got copied on that email right it was sent specifically to our public communications address and he cc'd all elected officials everyone is everyone has seen that email had an opportunity to review it is that correct it's from um, mr turnbull yeah anyone not had an opportunity to review that lance uh, I think you've seen it, and it probably should be read, in my opinion. I can read that. Okay, let's read it. I think things that were received early on, I think some sort of chronological order would not hurt in this moment. Yeah, he, um, actually, his is the first item I received, so um, I will read it. Bob Turnbull, I have lived in El Segundo for 23 years. The Law Enforcement Code of Ethics stands for a preface to the mission and commitment law enforcement agencies make to the public they serve. On June 3rd, Bill Whalen violated department policy, city code, and the code of ethics, which he swore and took an oath to uphold. By decisively posing for a photograph with protesters while on duty in police uniform holding a Black Lives Matter sign, which went viral on social media. His deplorable actions and lapse of judgment gave every police officer under his command the tacit approval to express their political views and beliefs verbally and physically by displaying political signs in uniform wherever they see fit. He has lost my trust and the trust of several other police leaders that came before him to effectively lead the professional officers of the El Segundo Police Department. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm. And now I will um, start to read the items in the order I received them regarding um, the Black Lives Matters movement. Hi, my name is Victoria Romley. I am an El Segundo resident. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate rest racism from our community. Black Lives Matter and I would like City Council to support that fact, not just in words, but also in policy. The citizens of El Segundo are ready for change, and if you're not, then we will vote in new council members who are. My name is Mindy Labayan, and I am an El Segundo resident, and I am here to put you on notice. Black lives matter. I demand that this city council publicly support the fact, both in words and in policy. We want action, or we will vote you out. My name is Griffin Troy. I am an alumni of ESHS. 
I am here to put you on notice. It is time that El Segundo takes steps to eradicate racism from our community. We expect action and support or we will vote you out. Black Lives Matter. I am Sarah Townsend. I am an El Segundo resident, taxpayer, and voter. And I am writing to say that El Segundo must do better. Black Lives Matter. We need clear, concrete steps towards making our community safe, supportive, and inclusive for people of color, particularly our black and brown neighbors. Help us make the changes or get out of the way. My name is Natasha Lee and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor. I am here to put you on notice. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want action or we will vote you out. Hello, my name is Mark Cavagnolo and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor. I am your constituent. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want explicit actions or we will vote you out. My name is Paula Lee and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor. I am here to put you on notice. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete measures to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want actions from our elected officials or we will vote you out. Hello, my name is Robin Ringette, and I am an El Segundo resident who lives on Maple Avenue. I live here, I buy coffee here, my children attend our schools. My family are your neighbors, we actively vote. It is time for the elected and appointed leaders of El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community by publicly supporting both in words and in policy that Black Lives Matter. Your community is wanting and your constituents are watching. El Segundo is a great place to live and work. Let's make it better for everyone. Respectfully, Robin. My name is Holly M. Crawford. I am an educator working in El Segundo. It is time for El Segundo City Council to publicly support that Black Lives Matter. We, the people, demand public support through action and policy. Holly M. Crawford. My name is Kelly Beach Sims and I am an El Segundo resident. I am a black woman. I have a black husband and black children. I am your neighbor. I am your constituent and I'm hired, and, excuse me. I am here to put you on notice. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism for our community. Words are not enough. We want action. Thank you for listening. My name is Nicole Reynoso. I am a South Bay resident and am employed in the city of El Segundo. I am here to put you on notice, Black Lives Matter. I demand that the city council publicly support the fact both in words and in policy. My name is Irene Pacheco and I am your neighbor. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want action or we will vote you out. My name is Kathy Depp and I am writing to put you on notice. Black Lives Matter. I demand that the city council publicly support the fact that both in words and in policy. It is time to take a meaningful stand against racism in this community. I strongly recommend you remove the police from El Segundo schools as a beginning. She's formerly of El Segundo and she's a grandparent of El Segundo students. My name is Alexandria Seal, and I am a resident of El Segundo. It is time for El Segundo to take steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. I demand that this, that this city council publicly support the fact that Black Lives Matter, not just in words, but in policy. We want action or we will vote you out. My name is Jeanette Davis and I live in here in El Segundo. I live here in El Segundo. I would like to see an end to racism of any form. It destroys basis rights of any individual. It must stop so all can enjoy freedom without fear. Thank you. My name is Aaron Workman and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor. I am your constituent and I am here to put you on notice. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want action or we will vote you out. We expect a comprehensive policy with concrete measures to be built quickly 
enacted immediately and upheld permanently. There will be no tolerance for racism, prejudice, or oppression in our community. Greetings. My name is Ben Watkins, and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor, I am your constituent, and I am here to put you on notice. It is time for El Segundo to take concrete steps to eradicate racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want action, or we will vote you out. My name is Hanaya Goldstein. I am an El Segundo resident. I am a small business owner. I am your neighbor. I am your constituent. And I am here to put you on notice. The citizens of El Segundo believe that Black Lives Matter. It is time for El Segundo's leadership to take concrete steps to eradicate racism, especially anti-Black racism from our community. Words are not enough. We want action. We are loud. We vote and we are not going anywhere. Thank you. Two more. My name is Seth Martin and I am an El Segundo resident. I am your neighbor. I asked my neighbors if any knew of a BLM demonstration I could participate a few, in a few weeks ago. And I received and returned was a swift, vast and strong, and the, sorry guys, the vitrol, I cannot pronounce that word, received, I received and returned was swift, fast, and strong. It's clear that many residents of El Segundo are happy to go with the status quo. The status quo is systemic racism. I want to hear from the leaders of El Segundo what they're going to do for their plan to reduce and defeat systemic racism, even if it makes people uncomfortable. No, especially if it makes those people uncomfortable be bold, Seth. I apologize, Seth. Our names are Jan and William Zucci, and we have been homeowners and residents in El Segundo for the past 21 years. Over the last couple of weeks, we have heard too many heartbreaking stories from African American residents, students, and parents about the racism they have had to endure in this town. El Segundo must do better. We demand that the city council publicly support the Black Lives Matter movement, both in words and in policy. We want concrete action or we will vote for more responsive city officials. And sorry, one more. My name is Candy Ali Watkins. I am an El Segundo resident, an El Segundo homeowner, a taxpayer, an Ed Fund donor, and parent of children in this school district. I am here to put you on notice. Citizens of El Segundo support Black Lives Matter. Citizens of El Segundo demand change. We are loud, we vote, and we are not going anywhere. And that is the last one. Madam Clerk, thank you for reading all those. It's great, appreciate it. And thank you for everyone's comments. Mr. Mitnick, any comments? <clears throat> um, hang on. Okay, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, uh, on the uh, Black Lives Matter stuff, that will be, um, uh, some of that will be commented on uh, in a little bit. The, you had three or four emails on Aviation Boulevard. This is the proposed bikeway green belt on aviation. And uh, as a minor council, you did ask, uh, you did direct staff to work with the residents in the unincorporated areas who are interested in having that done and we we have been so the the main issue now to move forward to applying for, apply for grant funding from metro is to get the actual property owner bnsf the railroad company to get them to agree to the use of their property for this purpose and as of this point in time um bnsf did inform metro that they were not in support of uh having the property used for uh, this purpose at this point in time. So an effort to step that step that up, uh, working with our public works director, Mark Watkins, our interim public works director, and our, our consultant, uh, Kobe King, we're trying to, um, we're pushing hard to get a meeting with as high up, uh, high level persons possible, BNSF and myself, to talk this through. But the, the official message, message provided to Metro is the property owner is not interested at this time. So until we can get a letter from BNSF saying they are supportive of this, we really can't move forward with the, the grant application. So I'm not trying to be a wet blanket or put a negative spin on this. We are following your direction. We're working hard to get access to BNSF to, to get them to allow the, their property to be used for this purpose. 
Uh, we probably should have an agenda item at some point down the road to get into more details as to why BNSF feels this way. Uh, this item's not on the agenda for tonight, but we will follow up and, and meet with the leadership of um, the Del Air um, community uh, to uh, share where things are. But um, you know, the, uh, these fo the folks advocating for this are doing a, a fantastic job, a lot of hard work and effort. Staff's trying to do its level best as well. Um, that's it for the follow-up from the speakers and uh, emails that came in. Thank you, City Manager. Okay, yeah, Councilman Nickel. I mean, Drew, sorry. Uh, yeah, I actually want to speak to the comments or, or the letter that was written in from uh, Mr. Turnbull. I know there were some other um, letters that were sent in um, kind of along the same lines, and I just wanted to kind of address this a little bit right now. Um, I understand the feelings of Mr. Turnbull and some other the law enforcement personnel who've dedicated their life to this profession and, and feel in a lot of cases that they're being unjustly attacked, um, painted with the same brush as I, as I kind of mentioned two weeks ago. And I also understand how, how some may look at the picture of Chief Whalen and, and see that as a political statement. In my personal opinion, I believe Chief Whalen did the right thing. And he has been doing the right things for our community as a whole since he got here, and especially in the past few months. When I saw the photo, um, I didn't see it as a political statement. What I saw was a leader making a key decision at a difficult time, uh, a decision that I am sure he struggled with, knowing that the optics were going to be divisive at best. And no matter what decision he made at that time, there was going to be a percentage of the people who disagreed with it. In the end, sometimes doing the right thing is a hard decision. But what I also saw in that photo of the chief was our kids. That was during the student process. So the, the people surrounding him were our students who maybe for the first time in their entire lives got out and exercised their right to be heard. Um, I saw a leader make a decision to, to support our kids and our community in a time that we desperately needed. Um, think about this for a second. For, for those kids, their first experience in a protest and with law enforcement combined was a positive one. And if we're trying to make real change and not just words to the perception of law enforcement, my feeling is that isn't this a great way to start it? In the past three months, we've faced an unprecedented pandemic. We've had five protests. Uh, and during that time, our chief and our law enforcement as a whole have handled themselves, in my opinion, very professionally and have truly taken care of our community. Uh, Chief, um, I know you're taking a lot of heat for this. Even more to the point, I know you're taking a lot of heat for this internally. And that's unfortunate because I think those individuals are missing the bigger picture here. The change this community seeks uh, is, is wanting really starts with you, Chief. It's a tall order and a long road, but, but based on what I have seen from you and your officers during these times, um, I believe we have the right person to lead us. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Giroux. <clears throat> Any other council comments before we move on? All right, item A, procedural motions. Uh, there's a consent item on the special agenda. So we're gonna go on that first. This would be item B on your special agenda. Yeah, I'm just looking at the city clerk to make sure I got that right. Resolution authorizing the city manager to provide written notice of intent to withdraw membership from the ICRMA, which is the Independent Cities Risk Management Authority. But Drew, first, what you need to do is vote on the procedural motion to consider a motion to read all ordinances. We need to do that first so that when you are at the special, you can vote on that one. Got it. Okay. Consideration of a motion to read all ordinances and resolutions on the agenda by title only and then State in your last name, state if you'd like to move approval of that, and then we'll need a second. State in last name is one, then Madam Clerk will take a roll call vote, vote on that. Drew, so moved. Thank you. First take second. Okay, Madam Clerk. Council Member Giroux? Yes. Council Member Nickel? Aye. Council Member Perstek? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel? Yes. Mayor Boyles. Yes. Okay, so your motion passed and now you can um, move move forward um, with your special agenda. 
Great. Okay. So back to item four, which I've already read. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar with one item? Nickel, so yeah. moved. I, I would like to pull that if possible. Can we get just That's a brief fine. discussion? Yeah. Let's pull it. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Mitnick. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I can have our finance director uh, give you a little brief presentation, but uh, while he's coming on online, let me just say this is sort of a housekeeping item in that um, the, the city council has talked to us before about uh, how we manage our workers' comp and general liability and ins insurance in general, and to always be sharpening our pencil and, and looking to see if we can um, save money and, and get better service. And so we are part of a risk management pool group. And uh, we, in following council direction and your interest here, we're looking at other options. And in order to start exploring other options, we would ha technically have to give notice to the current um, pool that we're part of that we are considering leaving. And so that's what this is. So I'll turn it over to the finance director. He'll provide a little bit more details and clarity and then staff's available for questions. Good evening, Mayor Boyles, uh, City Council members. Um, so to add to Scott's comments, uh, as part of the city looking at operational efficiencies, enhanced program productivity, program value, as well as cost, overall cost reductions, uh, the city is providing written notice of intent to withdraw membership from the Independent Cities Risk Management Authority. Uh, this is the city's risk uh, insurance pool. Uh, this is a procedural action that is required in order to look into the viability of alternative risk pools or to purchase insurance directly from the marketplace uh, the city directly. So this gives the city about five months to objectively review uh, what is in the best interest of the city, whether to remain with ICR or May, uh, to look at another, go with another risk pool or to purchase insurance directly from the marketplace. So I do want to point out that uh, my four years here with the city, um, I have experienced nothing but high customer service from ICRMA, high value. Um, and I have been personally uh, very happy with uh, being with the risk pool. But this is, again, in the city's best interest to occasionally uh, look at what else is out there. And at the end of the day, we very well could end up staying with ICRMA. We have until December 1st to uh, rescind the notice. I'm open for any questions. Thank you. The reason for my pulling this was that there's such an enormous amount of money relative to our budget that is at stake in these risk pools. I thought it a value while we have somewhat of an audience here to point out that this is not dissimilar from going to any sort of insurance market if you're at home about periodically reevaluating, do I have the right sort of insurance coverage for what I'm doing? It just happens for us. This is something that commands upwards of 4% of our budget uh, and is worth the while for us to look at periodically. And I understand that if we decide there's nothing better out there that we can opt right back in. Uh, and it is no way an aspersion on the level of service we've gotten from ICRMA, who took us when we were some of the laggards. And under a lot of your leadership, Joe, we've turned around our performance in the risk pool, uh, as well as some of the steps that we took with public works and some of the level of the claims that we've addressed. So. With that in mind, I would move approval for this. I just wanted this to be a little bit of a moment to share the methodology of what we do and why we're doing it. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Do we have a second? First, second. Okay, Madam Clerk, vote. Council Member Giroux. Aye. Council Member Nickel. Aye. Council Member Perstuck. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel. Aye. And Mayor Boyle. Yes. All right, pass this by vote. All right, great. Now we're moving on to staff presentations within the special agenda item one, citizens protest update, city manager. Hey, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, th three items under staff presentations. One is a uh, update on citizen protest uh, issue. The other is a um, recommendation to form a diversity, equity and inclusion commission. The third item is the COVID-19 update. So starting with the first uh, item, uh, uh, I will tee it up and then turn it over to the police chief and then there'll be uh, time for questions uh, from the city council. So in following along with the agenda here, just as a reminder to the council and the community, after the, the, the tragic death of George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis, 
there was a, a lot of unrest that, that took place uh, throughout the nation. And on May 30th, the, the governor of the state of California declared a, or proclaimed a statewide um, state of emergency and issued some administrative orders. And uh, right away within uh, 24 hours of that, uh, as city manager, um, I, I um, in consultation with the council, working with the city attorney, did uh, issue a, a state of emergency proclamation and, and a, an administrative order uh, to deal with the the, um, the, uh, the unrest issues. At that time, there was a, a, some rioting, looting taking place in various parts of the nation and in California. So in anticipation of what might come our way, we uh, that was done and then that was ratified by the city council at your meeting on, on June 2nd. So that that's those that type of proclamation is, is rare and the administrative orders like uh, that go along with it are, are rare, but we did that uh, in in part to ensure we were able to exercise the necessary powers and authorities that were need, needed. Uh, one of which was to put a curfew in place, and then shortly thereafter, the LA County did a county-wide curfew. But that administrative order has uh, that's no longer applicable. The state of emergency is in effect for up to 60 days, and when we feel it's appropriate, we can we can remove that. And in declaring a state of emergency has value uh, for future funding reimbursement because we have a lot of overtime involved in public safety and, and other staff members. Uh, and that process has worked uh, uh, very well. Um, that's really it for the, the for those two components of the state of emergency at the state, county, and, and city level. I will now turn it over to Police Chief Bill Whalen. He will give you an update on the various uh, citizen protests that have taken place and then um, uh, he'll provide an additional update. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, actually, there isn't a whole lot to update on this front. Um, we've had really only one uh, rally, we'll call it a rally slash protest since uh, we last spoke. In fact, many people in the audience were, were a part of that. And uh, I will say that it went off very nicely. Uh, there, very engaging and it's a very collaborative relationship with the police department. Uh, the event organizers reach out to us ahead of time and we're able to connect our on duty watch commander with the people engaged. That way we can make sure that uh, with the minimal police involvement, they're able to perform their event safely. And the one last weekend on Saturday uh, began at Maine and Imperial with a march down Main Street to the Civic Center and then returned back to Maine and Imperial. I believe we might also have one this Friday, which is Juneteenth. Uh, and Juneteenth is, is what is recognized uh, as a holiday and the end of slavery in the United States. And so that's, a, that's an important day to this movement. So I would expect that we're, we're only aware of one here in El Segundo, a potential get together, protest rally, whatever you, we're gonna call it. But um, there could be, we could see some regionally. And so that is something that we're paying attention to. As I've mentioned in the past, we are part of the Area G mutual response mutual aid agreement. And so we will be engaging our other law enforcement partners. If there is any information on large scale protests in the region, we'll be prepared for that as well. And that's all I had for an update. And I'm available if there's any questions. Okay, thank you, Chief. <clears throat> um, I would like to just add that on June 3rd, I think June 3rd was the first student protest, Chief Whalen, the one that Councilmember Drew, Drew referred to earlier as well. I happened to be there that day. Uh, then we went into our special meeting that day. And when I returned that evening, I was asked by several members of the community to review a pledge online that was a pledge uh, for a call to action. And that pledge was to review the police use of force policies, to engage our community by including a diverse range of input to report the findings of our review to the community and to seek feedback. And finally, number four, to reform our community's police use of force. And I'm really encourage, Chief, that you're already, I mean, that was only not even two weeks ago, and you've already made tremendous headway along those four initiatives. So I applaud you for that. I know the council is appreciative as well and look forward to seeing how things unfold. But thank you very much for taking action as you heard from the people that were in chamber today, many of them said action speaks louder than words and we've already taken some action and there's a lot more work to do, but it's a great start. So I just wanna thank you, Chief, for that. Mr. Mitnick. Um, 
Mr. Mayor, members of, of the council, um, I, um, I, I've been with the organization now for just about a year, and I would like to re remind the, the, the council and perhaps those watching that the police chief, uh, Bill Whalen, has been here about three years, and he has been reviewing and implementing changes to the police department over that that period of time with respect to the operating of policies and practices. And a lot of progress has been made. And just to reiterate, like any well-run um, operation, there's there's always room for improvement, and he's working on that. And um, and uh, it's his goal to make sure that we continue to go down down that path. And uh, that, that applies to issues being raised by uh, protesters and, and others, not just in El Segundo, but throughout the, the nation. So I just wanted to, to add that. And um, uh, the police chief and the city manager were, were committed to using best management practices and good government in, in going forward. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for chief? Comments, questions? No? Okay, great. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Menick. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, next item. The recommendation in, in front of you, and there is a, a brief report that was put together, is, and then again, this is following um, the feedback from the city council uh, in closed session and in, in, our, in, in uh, public discussions. Staff is recommending that you direct us to establish a diversity, equity, and inclusion Commission. This would be a, um, a separate commission, a citizens commission, and uh, to, to deal with uh, addressing some of the issues that have been um, uh, raised and articulated. And if you uh, so desire to do that, staff will get working on the, uh, the details uh, of that in terms of uh, the, the makeup of the, the committee, how many members, the, the interview process, uh, study topics, and time frame with uh, uh, deliverables, and so on. So uh, staff's available if you want to um, dig a little deeper on that and ask questions and so on. I think Councilman Nichol has a question. Councilman Nick, in, uh, in my experience with other committees and commissions and boards, uh, I have found that the, mo the, the greatest success is found when we allow those uh, CCBs to help to shape the bylaws of their own commission. Uh, I think if we ask staff to create the framework uh, we could potentially be boxing in a conversation that we really don't want to box in. I would love to engage the community. I mean, we heard tonight, I mean, Madam Clerk read over 22 letters written in. I mean, there is a community here that has a voice and they want that voice to be heard. And the five of us are only made better by the involvement of the community. You know, and yes, it is upon the five of us to set the policy, but that policy can be shaped by every member within our community. So I would love it if we set a, um, a very loose guideline uh, that we, the council, were able to interview and, uh, and help form that uh, commission or committee, whichever it gets named, and then the bylaws get written by them, essentially. I mean, as we know, to avoid Form 700, conflicts of interest, the city attorney will be all over this as to, you know, what... Uh, voting power this committee and or commission will have but uh it is an advisory board of such to us the council when uh when it comes to uh policies of this type so i just think that it'd be best if it was a, a loose framework okay councilman drew and then uh councilman first after that please. uh yeah again i i think the key here is that we have to do something as a as a city and as a council that has both teeth and legs it teeth means that it needs to mean something it, it, it has to to be palpable um as such i i think we should also as a council look at this and put it as part of uh, our strategic plan because once you commit to putting something in that plan it's going to happen and we're going to be measured by it and i think that's important and the reason why I say legs is, is that too often times in our history in this, these kind of situations, there's a, a huge focus on this at, a, at while it's happening. And then it tends to fade away when the next squirrel runs by and we want to look at that. And I want to make sure that from, from an education process as well, that we put something in place uh, that is measurable, that we're accountable for, and that can last all the way through to the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Drew. Councilmember Perstek. 
kind of concur with both Scott, uh, Council Members Nickel, Andrew. Um, you know, the we have had great success with two of our new com our newer commissions, the Technology and the Arts and Culture. And I think by allowing the this this new committee to form and bring in voices from all diversities to bet the, create the best uh, committee that possible, I think that's the best way to go and let it let it develop over time and let it develop um, um, you know let it develop without any constraint. And I do I just want to say you know uh, one of our community members, Avery Smith, had said you know. You, you you made great change with the pen and the sledgehammer and I really believe that I really believe in that sentiment and I just think that to council member Drew's point we we really need to make sure that there's metrics established for this and that we do make change for the community because everyone that resides here in in our town as well as works in our town should feel safe and and welcomed and engaged so um, I do want to make sure that we give this community you know our, our give this committee our highest priority and that we really reach out to all members of the community to see who would like to be engaged and we let the committee form over time and develop. Thank you, Councilmember Perstuck. I just, now that you mentioned Avery real quick, Mr. Nickel, if you don't mind, he, he also suggested a couple of real tangible outcomes. One is renaming a street. Another would be a proclamation or a declaration of sorts. So do we, are we considering this commission to make those kinds of decisions? And also, are we probably not gonna to wanna to participate as council members on this committee other than a liaison role if we establish that or are we gonna let the group decide? So just a couple, what are we, how's, how tactical do we want them to get in nature, like to Mr. Smith's suggestions, which I thought were good ones, um, or is that a policy decision at the council or is that something that the, maybe they could bring up as a recommendation to us and then do we what do we see our involvement some committees were part of the committee some were not so i know we had this discussion as well i just want to i don't know if we've gotten to a decision there councilman nickel so to that point um i truly believe that we need to as a uh, as a council here agree to advocate for um, allocating staff time and city attorney's time to sit and discuss and let's spend some money, let's invest some money in this. Because if you look at all of our CCBs, not any of those CCBs can actually truly make a decision without it coming before us to um, you know, rubber stamp or move forward. Um, and some of those CCBs are really just advising. You know, as, as you and council member Giroux know from EDAC, there's not a lot of decisions made at EDAC, right? You vote on things, you discuss things, and you and you make recommendations that then get elevated to the council level. Uh, environmental committee, look at them. They've been trying for years to chisel out maybe even just a comment in the CEQA process, which the city attorney has said on many levels why that cannot happen. Um, so from that standpoint, I think that you know, from my experience on these committees and commissions, knowing like if, if we at least let the public know coming in, hey, this is how these CCBs work. It, you, you know, you're not the final say on things. Ultimately, you're an advisory board. And, and it's and really, I would say that that board's purpose is to council member Giroux's point of like, let's keep this conversation going, even when there's no protest. When there's no news coverage and they moved on to coronavirus, uh, you know, COVID-21, you know, that's when this conversation has to happen. And so, but I, I think it is very, very important. And I do not think that we go into this with, uh, you know, the blinders on saying and selling this to, to the community that it's going to be a committee or a commission that's going to have um, the ability to truly make a decision. You know, because as you guys all know, the committees and commissions don't make a lot of decisions. They make recommendations that get elevated to council. Well, Mr. Nickel, to that point, we also talked about wanting to do a better job of dovetailing CCB strategy recommendations with our overall city council vision and strategy. And um, maybe knowing that we're going to the strategy session now, Mr. Mitnick and budgeting, perhaps there's a way to stand this committee up quickly enough to say, is there a way to Mayor Pro Tem's point early on about incorporating 
specific outcomes in the strategic plan? Is there a way to get that group's feedback now so that we can actually dovetail these into our strategic plan? They're going to lead us from the fall on. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I can, the answer is yes. Now, to, to have the commission uh, formed and have had a few meetings and have that uh, their specific recommendations done by um, the time we do the strategic plan, which we're going to come to council on, on July 22nd with that, uh, the logistics don't work on that. But what was suggested before was to have this commission established and to, to, to have um, that be part of your work plan to have the commission established and deal with uh, uh, the, these type of issues and work on that over the next several months. Uh, that will be part of the strategic plan. Now, what the group does, what they work on, um, that 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 has to be determined. But essentially, I'll tell you this, uh, because we didn't want to put the cart before our, uh, the horse here. Um, for example, they one of the things they could work on is to review our diversity and inclusion policies and practices here in the city to date. What's worked well, uh, uh, what hasn't. Uh, they could uh, look at partnerships with the school district. They could look at a variety of um, um, other topics and to dovetail with the um, culture, um, the, uh, the um, culture and um, Art, arts commission uh, and look at, at that type of thing. So it's a little bit wide open right now. And I, I, I would, we just need direction to start this process and, and to move forward. And we can talk in more detail when you have your strategic planning session about some of the deliverables for the commission. Now, it will take a little while to get the commission up and running because you, you'll want to do, um, we'll do it as quickly as possible, but you want to do a little bit of advertisement to get, get it out there that you're soliciting uh, nominations. So you want to uh, cast a fairly wide net among the community to ensure a diversity of the commission members in terms of gender, age. You know, we do not have a youth commission here in town. So this is a great opportunity for young people to get involved. So we would like, uh, we would recommend you spend a little bit of time casting that net, doing some outreach, uh, get a good, get some folks to come in, um, have a, two members of the council do interviews, and then um, have a recommendation of, of a group uh, to be selected to do this, and then have um, some meetings. Now, part of their meetings will be doing some due diligence on their own part, doing some um, research and homework, have some um, experts come in and talk to them. They, they may have questions of some of the department heads, they may have questions of some leaders, uh, thought leaders in the field, some professors, that type of thing. So this is not the type of thing we can just flip a switch and within one month you have a finished product. Uh, this would- uh, Yeah, I'm not, Scott, I'm mean gonna just cut you off. I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm asking though, if there's a way to have a placeholder within the strategic plan, because I think everyone on the council agreed and some dollars to Councilman Nichols point allocated for this so that three months in, four months, and they have a strategic direction for us. Like these are the outcomes we know are gonna make a difference based on our research and our experiences in life. Let's move towards that. And I know Councilman uh, Drew wants to say something. Yeah, please. Yeah, and again, kind of on the same point is that we all wanna get something done right now. And you hear people that, that, are, that are talking in public comment, they wanna get it done right now. And the truth is to do it right takes time. So um, I think we need to take the right amount of time with the right amount of feedback. We're gonna make mistakes at the beginning and then we're gonna be able to fix them. Um, let's just do it right and, uh, and get a plan that lasts far beyond when we are no longer on council anymore and it's something that we can be proud of as a, as a community. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Perstock. Yeah, and I, to, to Lance's um, point, it, it will take time because change has to happen continuously and it's something you should be focused on all the time. But the one thing, um, you know, when uh, Councilmember Nickel mentioned, we really want to put staff time to this and money. And I think it's not just the commission that we should be looking at. We should look, be looking at our own internal operations and making sure our workforce is feeling that there, um, there's equality and that there's opportunities for everybody at, at, at long diversity lines. Just want to make sure this is multi-threaded um, that there's not just one task force, but there's multiple task force. So at the end, we have um, change, a systemic change across <coughs> the organization and our community. Mr. Mitnick, do you mind? Oh, Mayor Pro Tem, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I would just add one piece in that I would prefer that we not get particularly tactical, even at the advisory level with the commission, 
I think by definition, uh, we would hope this commission would expose some blind spots. And as such, some of the uh, changes they may like to see or some of the things that they think will be have most impact or most lasting impact might be things that we, we as yet don't understand or know. So I think they have to have a bit of maybe a bit of extra time at their meetings uh, certainly some time and guidance from some staff about how we can add things and what, what things do, because we're going to likely bring people into this commission with limited experience with city government. And so I think that they'll need to, hey, here's what lies within the city's remit to work with and how we can address specific concerns. Uh, but I think we need to give them a pretty broad canvas to work from, because it might be a degree of things that we have not yet contemplated. You know, we tend to think in terms of power lines, pavements, and pensions, uh, and that is not going to answer the mail on this. Mr. Mayor, if I can add, uh, typically two of us are assigned to a specific committee. I know you just dealt that out uh, to all of us in the past couple weeks. Would it, um, and I hope the city attorney will agree with what I'm about to say, but I would prefer it if this committee was the type of committee where, say, council attendance was on a rotating basis. So each and every one of us can be present, can hear the discussion and not just get the report of the discussion. Because as you know, when you're, when you're part of a conversation, it has a much deeper effect on you. Mr. Hensley, are you there? Okay, let, we can come back to that one. I don't see him coming up. I'm, oh, here he is. Sorry. Um, yeah, we'll work through the um, and the council can always attend um, any noticed commission or committee meeting. Your ability to participate, if there's a majority of you, is limited. But yes, we can we can work out that issue. Okay. So, do you have consensus, Scott? Do you need us to go to a vote on this, or are you good? If um, it might be helpful just to, to, to confirm that yeah, uh, okay. the council is supportive of the uh, recommendation and we'll come back at the next uh, meeting with uh, details in terms of the process. But to, to be clear, council, we hear you loud and clear. You want to move quickly on this and we will go as fast as we can to achieve that objective. Well, I'm hearing two things. One is we want to move quickly on allocating funds and proper resources to give it the attention that it deserves. We don't want to rush into things, but we do want to make sure when the commission you feels like they're ready for some things that are strategic outcomes, not tactical to the mayor pro temps point, that those are also dovetailing the strategic plan. And we're not necessarily waiting until the fall of 2021 to make that happen. Is that a fair, did I state that correctly? Anyone object? Okay, cool. Scott, Scott objects with a T, one T. <laughs> no objection, no objection. Do you want to set a timeline uh, success criteria for when the, um, information will get out for the new committee being formed and taking applications when we can start to interview people and when ultimately we could essentially have say that that initial nine uh person body uh because if not you know i just yeah. i in the in the current political landscape i would have i would hate to see six weeks go by yeah. and then it'd be that hey we're not doing anything about this and i mean me personally uh, i know that we've been asked to you know, at the drop of a hat, attend a special meeting, whether it be Zoom or something else, I am happy to clear my schedule and do whatever needed to interview people and get this rolling as fast as staff can bring it up. Great point, Mr. Mitnick. Yeah, we, we can do that. We can start tomorrow soliciting interest. So I'll, I'll work with Barbara Voss, we'll get the word out, start casting the net, and we'll indicate, hey, this commission is being formed. We're gonna start the process to um, select um, um, applications. In fact, we'll go ahead and create one and we come back to you on July 22nd. We may have a meeting prior to that, but we, we hear you um, uh, loud and clear. So we'll start uh, the process right away. And then we come Mr. back to you, we'll have very specific deadlines. Okay, Councilman Nichols, that work for you? Okay. All right, I, I'll move approval as uh, commission. Sure, we'll second. Second. <laughs> Sorry, everyone went at the same time. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Funny. Stacey, take laughing. your pick. Last names, please. Giroux, second. I think M. Boyles was first. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And roll call vote, please. Yes. Uh, Council Member Giroux. Yes. Council Member Nichol. Aye. 
Council Member Perstuck. Yes. Ma uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel. Yes. Mayor Boyle. Yes. You got it. Five zero. Commissioner. Alrighty. Granted. Great. Thank you. All right. It's a big step for it's good. It's just a start, but it's good. Okay. Item three. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. So this will be myself and our fire chief, Chris Donovan, giving you an update on COVID-19. So we're in the unusual, unique, once in a, a career lifetime experience of managing multiple um, uh, state of emergencies at, at the same time. And so the, the other emergency that's still out there is the COVID-19 coronavirus situation. We've had many updates with the council, with the community, many um, closed session discussions uh, with the with the council, just as a reminder, the state of California and the county of Inter uh, county of slip there, county of LA and the uh, city of El Segundo issued their own state of emergency proclamations a few months ago, and a number of administrative orders and revisions to those uh, since that time, with respect to shutting down the economy and now reopening the economy. So, um, lots of activity and history there. I'm here not. I'm not going to walk you through each of those. Well, we are moving into our, our end stage three in terms of the recovery. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Donovan to, to walk you through that. And he promises not to get too detailed, but we do encourage questions from the council if you need clarity with respect to the timing of the reopening of uh, different businesses and city services. And also Barbara Voss, our economic, our um, deputy city manager slash economic development manager will walk you through successes that we're having um, in reopening uh, some of the businesses. Thank you. Go ahead, Chief Donovan. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members of council. Thank you for this opportunity. I'll be brief on on the uh, health metrics. Although the reason I continue to talk about the health metrics, the, these this is the the basis in which the governor and the county health officer makes the decisions in reopening. And so we, we pay very close attention to the number of new cases uh, that are. Um, formed over uh, the testing process. We look at testing, we look at hospital bed availability, that is a direct relation to the ability of having surge capacity, that is if we had more patients that needed hospitalization, there'd be beds, and then ventilation, uh, which is advanced medical equipment. And so we pay very close attention to this on a daily basis. Uh, on, a, on a more uh, a high level review, from a testing perspective, uh, the testing has been um, going at a very steady stream. There's over 8,000, excuse me, 825,000 members within Los Angeles County who have been tested. Uh, as of this afternoon, 75,084 have tested positive. That's an increase of 1,337. They're currently testing at about an 8% positivity rate. Um, unfortunately, there's 2,959 people that have died from COVID-19. That's an increase of 33 uh, um, uh, from yesterday. Locally here in El Segundo, we had an increase of one. We have 39 cases. Um, in comparison to the county, we have had 1,147 of our residents tested. Uh, that is a 3.3% positivity test rate, uh, which in comparison to the county is um, a good, a good marker for us. That said, we still follow the LA County Public Health Order. And as a reminder for the community, on April 28th um, of 2020, Governor Newsom announced the resiliency roadmap stages in California, and there were four stages. Stage one was when we were very restrictive, the state at home order was related to safety and preparedness. Stage two of the governor's order talks about opening in lower risk workplaces. Stage three is in higher risk workplaces and stage four would be the end of the stay at home order. In California, we're currently still at stage two, which is the opening of lower risk workplaces. That said, the governor allowed counties on a county by county basis to apply for a variance. And in Los Angeles County, effective May 18th, the County of Los Angeles did indeed apply for a variance and it was issued. And what we have seen is a easing into what we're referring to as stage three. Uh, what, what I have in the past talked about is a stage 2A, uh, 2B and 2C. And by way of example, over the last month, we've seen gradual reopenings in segments of our, um, of our community. 
Uh, you'll remember beaches and golf courses were the first um, uh, areas that opened in the state in the phase A of the county um, uh, uh, health order. Following that was outdoor activities such as tennis and pickleball. Restaurants then were opened at a 60% capacity. We then saw vehicle-based parades that were allowed, a library uh, for curbside pickup. Our last um, opening shows gyms are, are now opened at a 50% capacity. Uh, and we're watching closely with the LA County Public Health Office as the new health orders come out. That said, uh, what we've done locally with our incident management team and with the various department directors is we've worked very hard to be well positioned to reopen quickly with our programs and our services to our community. And so uh, we're, we're mindful that there are still some closures, um, for instance, youth sports, uh, basketball, volleyball courts, baseball, soccer fields are still not um, allowed for opening in Los Angeles County. Bars and nightclubs are still closed, arcades, bowling alleys, movie theaters, live performances and concert venues with large uh, uh, groupings and festivals and theme parks are still closed. Uh, but the, the top of that uh, list, particularly with the youth sports, um, uh, we're spending a lot of time preparing and uh, teeing up, if you will, in preparation as we start to see these um, opportunities reopen. And so as the city manager mentioned, we have a proclamation that was issued. We, we have two administrative orders that have been revised. And on the back end of this, we have an awful lot of effort that's been put in to prepare for when we see this next uh, LA County Health order open uh, to allow for uh, more opportunities in our community. And so with that, I'll, I'll end my uh, presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. So, Chief, so you're saying that statewide we're in stage two, but in LA County we're in stage three. Yes, sir. Yet LA County was reporting more than half of the cases, half of the deaths, half of everything else. Correct. So if that's the case, um, why don't we just go for stage four? And, and the reason why I'm saying that is, is that these half measures, it's, it's like being almost pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You're either open or you're closed. In the end, I can go into a restaurant, I can go to the beach, I can do all these things, but my kids can't play baseball. It, it, it's, it's an infuriating situation, I think, in town. Um, it, it's handcuffing, again, I've used that twice tonight, uh, everyone. Um, what can we do? Because what we're all getting, and, and I probably got eight texts while, I'm, while I've been on this meeting about this type of thing. I know the schools are struggling with it and what they're going to be able to do. What can we do? Because a lot of the orders seem to be contradictory. Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. I wish I had a great answer for you. The state governor has provided guidance and the guidance is his roadmap to resiliency. Ultimately, it's the individual health officers in the counties that provide the health orders that open up for the easing of restrictions. And so uh, what we need to do is uh, confer with the LA County health officer through the LA County Public Health, through the Board of Supervisors, uh, to be uh, stay close to where they are in terms of the decision making that's taking place, and and we have been doing that. We we've been working closely with um, our constituencies and uh, working to get the latest information and updated information that, that we can share with you. But ultimately, it's related to uh, the LA County Public Health officers' amending of these orders through the variants. Uh, that the governor would accept the variance and allow the health officer to proceed. I wish I had a better answer for you, sir. I know you can't answer and I know you can't act unilaterally. I, I was just venting on you a little bit and I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions for Chief Donovan? No, okay, Mr. Mitnick. Thank you, Chief, appreciate that. Okay, and Chief, you, uh, Chief, you cover the incident management team, right? Uh, yes, sir. The incident management team is still in place. They're still working. Um, they're working collectively with um, our uh, public works director and our human resources director as we look at city operations 
working with uh, Meredith Pettit in our um, recreation programs, uh, assisting um, with uh, business recovery efforts um, as needed. And uh, we look at them as a, con a continuation of they're that they're the utility tool that's available for supporting um, all of our endeavors and as we reopen um, uh, following the health orders. Okay. Um, Council, I know that there were some concerns. Uh, I, I know you want to move on to the next item, but since we're all here, uh, have we fully addressed your concerns about the timing of opening of sports fields, playgrounds, and that type of thing, the organized sports and all that? Are, are we good on that? I, I know Council Member Perstuck had some specific questions about that. I don't, she might have, she might not be on right now. She's trying to reconnect. Okay, because she definitely had some questions about parks and sports. So, uh, and, and then pool has come up. I know that there's been a date put out there. Maybe we could just clarify that too. That would be helpful. Sure, Meredith Pettit, our um, Rec and Park Director, she is on this Zoom awesome. meeting. There she is, a uh, nice backdrop there. So um, if you don't mind, Meredith, uh, if it's okay with the Mayor and the Council to talk about the, the timing of the opening and talk about some of the, um, the, the youth sports, so whether it's a uh, Little League and um, soccer and all these different things, swimming, water polo, uh, general, general swimming, the, the timing um, and uh, the use of playgrounds and things like that. And then of course the skate park. So uh, these are some of the questions that have been coming in from the community and from um, the council members. Thank you. Sure. So um, thank you for the questions. Uh, just to remind and reiterate uh, what parks and rec facilities are currently open. Uh, all of the parks are technically open for passive use, which is walking, jogging, playing, picnicking, um, playgrounds remain closed. Uh, also the golf course and driving range are open uh, and at this point the uh, restaurant uh, will remain closed moving forward. Our tennis, paddle tennis, pickleball courts are open with restrictions and that still includes uh, singles play only and reservations are required. Our dog park is open, uh, farmers market reopened last week uh, we'll be on a regular schedule moving forward with farmers market um, and the restrooms at rec park are available uh, for our patrons here uh, with regards to aquatics facilities uh, the last health order did authorize public pools to reopen and we have set the date of uh, we will be open by july 1st uh, we're aiming, aiming for uh, that week of the 29th uh, but no later than july 1st uh, right now we are uh, stacking up our staff, uh, making sure that their certifications are still applicable. And um, they are also receiving some COVID related training uh, for making rescues and minimizing contact uh, in that instance. Um, we've been working really, really closely with all of our user groups, both on the uh, athletic field, sports, uh, with baseball, softball, flag football, lacrosse, uh, to name a few, as well as the swimming and water polo groups. Uh, and every group has been very cooperative, uh, really understanding the need to put our protocol and plans and guidances in place uh, to allow us to move very quickly when we do get authorization from the county. Uh, so really, really appreciate that. Uh, just want to reiterate that any, any participants of those specific groups can contact their board members, uh, the administrators of the sports leagues, and um, get their information directly from them in terms of timing or future plans. Uh, all of those groups are up to speed with uh, the city's posture on this. Um, the reason I wanted to say, uh, you know, that ball fields and, and basketball and volleyball, those types of activities are still not allowed is uh, and and you talk about visiting restaurants and, and other activities at the beaches is that six foot physical distancing and you know playing baseball you're sharing equipment uh there's a lot of contact uh, flag football fair you know there's a fair amount of contact soccer there's a fair amount of contact so it seems to me that the county is really trying to hold off on those types of facilities uh, that attract team sports uh, that have that closer contact and shared equipment, because those are the main considerations is the distancing and uh, those 
shared touch points, uh, whether that be a ball, baseball bat. Um, and so that's typically what I'm gleaning from the situation. We just got word today that the next health order could include splash pads, uh, which don't apply here in El Segundo, and lawn bowling, which we have a lawn bowling green, but I wouldn't say that uh, we have a, an avid lawn bowling uh, group. So um, as far as the skate park, uh, the preliminary guidance is going to require uh, reservations, um, advanced signups so that we can uh, monitor the capacity of the skate park. Uh, what we've seen being proposed to the county is one skater per thousand foot. Uh, and uh, our preliminary estimates actually would limit uh, the skate, El Segundo skate park to probably about six skaters at a time. So we'll have to be really dil diligent in how we roll that out. We'll probably have modified hours uh, as well as staff on site uh, to um, manage all of that. So we do have some options that we're internally uh, discussing and evaluating so that again, when we do get that county health order, we'll be ready to turn that operation on as quickly as possible because we will have a plan in place to do so. Um, I think that's it as far as the updates, um, but certainly can answer your questions if I, if I miss something. I got one question, Mara. Thank you for that. So I think the next organized sport that uses campus is soccer, I think, in terms of starting. Any indication yet, or we're still waiting to see whether or not that will be likely to be allowed? Um, you know, we were anticipating these team sports to probably be allowed in in the month of July at some point. Um, you know, the spring sports are baseball, softball. Um, most of those uh, leagues have um, sort of canceled their regular season and potentially holding out hope for some uh, modified play in July and August, should they be allowed to do so. Uh, AYSO uh, has a phased approach ready to ready to roll out if they get the approval. Uh, and so what they're talking about is uh, even when they do are, uh, you know, get access to the facility, um, it'll probably be small groups um, playing, uh, doing drills at first and easing into larger uh, team competition uh, later on. So it, it's all kind of a, an easing in approach, as Chief Donovan says, even when we do open facilities. Uh, we've been successful at the golf course and here at the tennis courts uh, by opening little by little and establishing those rules and getting our uh, participants um, comfortable with the changes. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, there is a possibility of soccer in the fall. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Any other questions for Ms. Petta? No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mitnick, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Mayor, members of council. We'll continue to keep the community updated through our website, social media, and other sources, and with the applicable sports organizations. So. Um, we'll do our, our level best to get that word out there and sustain it. Um, well, if, if council likes, we, we, I could, I can have Barbara Voss do a quick uh, update on the, um, the business front. You did direct us to work with, uh, the, you gave very, uh, specific and explicit direction and powers to do what we can to help stimulate those businesses that have been, um, negatively impacted by the closure in particular in the downtown area and other shopping districts. and pleased to report that there have been a variety of um, uh, successes in terms of uh, we did waive the uh, temporary use permit fees and encroachment permit fees and a lot of flexibility. We're very grateful to the support from police and fire to allow for sidewalk dining uh, in various portions of the city in particular in the downtown area on Main Street on uh, um, Richmond and other streets. So uh, if you like, uh, Barbara Voss can give you uh, some updates there and um, answer whatever questions you may have, but we want to be sensitive to your time. Thank you. I think that'd be great. Right, anyone opposed to hearing from Mrs. Voss? No, okay, thank you. All right, good evening, Mayor and members of council. Thank you for not being opposed to hearing from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll keep it brief. 
So uh, as you know, Richmond Street closed on Monday to allow the restaurants to have adequate time to prepare. Uh, the city uh, closed the, the street and uh, gave the restaurants the guidance that they um, could set up how they wanted to set up um, as long as uh, they adhere to the safety of you know, keeping um, a certain distance from the barriers and uh, of course adhere to all the uh, county um, guidelines and protocols for safety um, for the diners. And so tomorrow night, they're going to be open. Uh, it's Deluca and uh, Slice and Pint and Second City Bistro. And so you'll see um, some tables out there probably this evening as you're maybe passing by or tomorrow. Um, and uh, as Scott mentioned, uh, public works and planning and police and fire, uh, we all worked collaboratively together to make this happen um, quickly, not only on Richmond Street, but we had um, I think, gosh, we're probably in the 40s of applications, number of applications um, for different levels of modifications so that restaurants could add additional seating um, to uh, increase revenues and, and uh, people uh, in seats um, so that they can uh, rebound from this uh, pandemic and, and hopefully, um, you know, get up and running um, in a modified way uh, that keeps them in business and uh, keeps everyone safe. So that's very exciting. Uh, the process was uh, definitely included a lot of outreach um, and a lot of uh, working with each individual business owner. Uh, and uh, thank you to the business owners for um, you know doing a quick job of getting their applications in and being flexible and working with planning and building safety and public work staff um, to make this happen. So we are, this is a pilot program. So we're continuing to um, evaluate and see how things go. Um, you know, recommend that we all, as we go out and dine um, in different locations than we're used to outdoors, uh, are respectful of neighbors and neighboring businesses and um, traffic and noise and things that may make it difficult for those around. Um, to adjust to this new situation. I think it'll work better for everyone and, and uh, be more successful if we're all just mindful of uh, our surroundings in terms of, um, you know, who may be impacted. Uh, we had the, switching gears a bit, we had the um, elected officials and business leaders roundtable released last week and um, have several um, very complimentary um, comments and feedback from um, the regional community. We um, tried to push that out as, as wide as we could within the LA County area and um, uh, represented the city very well. It was kind of a joint um, purpose. We definitely wanted to share information about how businesses of all sizes and across all industries are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and how they're adjusting um, and, and keeping their business going. Um, we also wanted to highlight the types of businesses that we have in El Segundo and how they are doing cutting ed edge research and um, uh, sort of creative and innovative and different things that um, are all happening within our five square miles. Um, and it tells the story of our exciting business community in a very different way. So those are the two highlights. We're also doing, uh, we have uh, backtobusiness.com which uh, it leads right to El Segundo Business.com as a redirect, um, but it aligns with the Back to Business campaign. And we are doing regular updates to that web page, web page with the new protocols and guidelines. So it's an easy source, easy reference. We're working closely with the Chamber of Commerce uh, to help get information out to people. And um, we're also sending our, our e-blast to our, um, our business list that keeps growing every day um, and uh, trying to get the information out that way. Thank you, Mrs. Ross. Any questions? Comments? No, I don't see any. Thank you. Great work. Can't wait to get out there Wednesday night. Tomorrow night. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Mitnick, are we, is that it for COVID items? Uh, it is. And you, just a reminder, at the end of this council meeting, if you want, you can go over to um, restaurants in the downtown area and help out the cause. So just point that out as well. Yes, indeed. 
lead by example. I'll be doing that. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mitnick, are we on to, I believe we're on to the consent calendar and regular agenda, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Do we have, um, first off, let's see here. Do we have a, a motion, consideration of a motion to read all ordinances and resolutions on the agenda by title only? You already did that, remember, so that you could. Oh, but that was a separate meeting. Okay, I thought we'd have to do it again. No, no, no. Okay. You're, you're good. We already have approved that motion. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Yes. Do we have any polls? Ms. Yeah, Mr. Number seven. Seven, all right, thank you. Any other polls? No. Okay. Again, state your last name, please. If you'd like to make a motion to approve items one through six on a consent calendar, please make that motion. First six, so moved. Thank you. Pimentel, second. Great. Madam Clerk. Council Member Giroux? Aye. Council Member Nichol? Aye. Council Member Perstack? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel? Yes. Mayor Boyles? Yes. Okay, so I vote except for number seven. Great. Okay, Mr. Drew, item seven. Yeah, I, this is actually just more of a clarification on this because when I I, I was kind of was in the audience when when this whole thing was was kind of going on, and I want to make sure that uh, Mr. Mitnick, what this is about. This is the money that was uh, negotiated with Waypoint to be specifically put towards affordable housing initiatives. And this is just basically forming, basically us saying that we're doing with that money what we were going to do rather than putting it into the general fund. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, correct. We were given specific direction on that night when you worked out the um, uh, uh, development agreement issues with DR, uh, DR Horton on the Waypoint project. They made a $5.3 million payment in, in lieu of providing uh, affordable housing units. Um, there was some skepticism and concern about will we actually take that money and build some units. So the first step along the, this process is to do a request for qualifications from potential uh, affordable housing service providers. So we're going to do that, get some um, um, qualifications uh, proposals in. We'll review those. We'll, we'll then come back to City Council for recommendation to hire a firm and to get hopping on uh, setting up um, a mechanism to produce affordable housing units uh, and manage them thereafter. Great. Thank you. You bet. Okay, thanks. Any other further comments or questions on this matter? Okay. Someone like to move approval? Move to approve. Thank you. That was true. True. Sorry. You're good. Perfect. First, second. All right, Madam Clerk. Council Member Giroux. Aye. Council Member Nichol. Aye. Council Member Persuck. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel. Aye. Mayor Boyles. Yes. All right, five zero. You're good to go. All righty. Thank you. Okay, now we're on to item C. Public hearings eight. Conduct a. Or, I'm sorry. Continue a public hearing introduced by title only and waive further reading of an ordinance establishing a short-term home sharing rental permit pilot program to allow and regulate home sharing in the city's residential zoning districts, which will run from September 1, 2020 through December 31st, 2021. This is a time and place here to fix, to continue that is a presentation. public hearing. All right. Mr. Mitnick, I assume Mr. Lee will be presenting or someone from his staff? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council of uh, 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 Planning and Building Services Director Sam Lee will make this presentation. Let me just uh, preface it that this has been a long windy road and it's not unique to El Segundo when you deal with the short term issue. Um, it does often uh, go in many uh, different directions as each community tries, tries to wrestle with this very various issue. So we believe staff has been very responsive and following up from the last time this was in front of City Council when you gave a specific direction of uh, revisions and things to include. So having said that, I will turn it over to Mr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Lee, if I may, this is Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel. I have to recuse myself from this item once again. I have a commercial conflict at work. Great. 
Chris, you will be placed in the waiting room and then I will let you back in once it's finished. Just turn the page. Understood, thank you. Yes. Uh, Mayor Boyles, uh, members of the council, um, over the past uh, uh, several years, uh, the, the city council has um, has held uh, numerous public meetings, um, considered various different types of short-term rentals for the city of El Segundo. And I thought it would be nice to kind of provide a brief presentation um, and explain the current ordinance before you tonight. So um, as an agenda, as a brief agenda, um, as I said, I'll go over the, uh, what, the what the program, um, El Segundo's program covers. Um, I'll also talk about uh, responsibilities of the, um, the owner as well as the host platform. Um, Hosts, and um, from there, um, I, I do need to discuss a few changes um, that um, uh, that's been implemented in the, the new ordinance. That's a little bit different than what you looked at in in March, and I'll end with uh, what the next steps are, or how to get this ordinance passed and, and uh, moving forward. So, um, what is El Segundo's short-term rental program? Um, it's a pilot program. Um, and uh, it's an experimental trial period. Um, it has a sunset uh, date. So if no further action is taken by the council, um, then the, the ordinance will sunset and it will die in December of 2021. Um, uh, in the world of short-term rentals, this is a very limited type of short-term rental. It is a home sharing only. Um, it is only for overnight stays. Um, uh, it does not allow any parties, conferences, or events of any kind. Um, and there's a specific requirement that the, um, the owner of the property has to be the, has the use of the property as a primary resident and is occupying the home. So under the owner's responsibility, um, and there are specific things that they need to make acknowledgments for, um, they need to sign an affidavit that uh, they are the primary resident of this property. Um, they, they will sign an affidavit that stipulates um, they will comply with all of the operational conditions in the ordinance. I won't go into detail of the specific items. I think we've all heard it before. Um, they also will sign um, something that says that they understand that they have no vested interest um, in case the city ends the program in, in some time in the future. The um, owner must present, um, um, uh, the owner must be present during the um, in-house stay um, of the short-term rental. Um, the ordinance allows up to two guests per bedroom um, and the permit will be revoked if the owner violates um, uh, operational conditions um, two times or the owner violates the unruly gathering ordinance also known as the party house ordinance uh, one time. Um, the host platform responsibilities. Um, the, they are responsible for collecting the transient occupancy tax and submit that to the city. Uh, they need to verify that all advertisement for short-term rentals includes a city permit number. Um, and, um, and they must remove unpermitted listings at the city's request. And they will also provide a quarterly report of all total listings uh, for city of El Segundo. So, so some of the changes in the, from the previous ordinance is, um, um, again, I want to reiterate this because this was something that uh, was a bone of contention is that um, our short-term rental is a home share only. Uh, you, can, you cannot uh, rent out the entire house. The primary resident of the owner must reside and stay with the, um, the people who are renting uh, rooms uh, uh, or, or portion of the house. Um, we removed, at the direction of the council, we removed the, the um, multiple or simultaneous booking limit. Um, and we also made changes to the R1, R2, R3 zones where short-term rental is allowed in those zones, but when it's, um, they're only allowed when it's used as a single family dwelling use. Um, the last change I wanna talk about is a new county order that was passed uh, last Friday on June 12th and in it, it states that um, um, 
it's a little confusing because it allows um, short-term rentals to open with the new order. But as part of that, uh, the, the stipulation is that they will not allow um, home sharing. Um, and that goes along with um, if you're sharing a home with the uh, property owner, um, you, you don't have the proper social distancing or not. So the, um, the order specifically prevents um, home sharing um, at this time. Um, we feel that this could have an impact on if the order is not lifted by the time that this ordinance is supposed to go into effect, which is uh, September 1, then uh, there will be a delay. So, the, so we have a proposal uh, if council give us a direction to proceed to say that um, if the county order is in place um, and it has not been lifted by the time September 1 rolls around, that we would um, uh, implement the ordinance when, uh, when it's possible um, within 30 days of the lifting of the order. And then um, the, uh, the ordinance will be in effect um, 15 months um, after that time period, so that we could still have our pilot program at the earliest at the earliest possible time. So the next step is to um, introduce the ordinance tonight, um, but uh, it will be introduced with direction to substitute language, uh, taking into consideration the county order, um, schedule the second reading and adoption for July 21st, um, the administrative guidelines and a fee resolution will also be brought at the second second uh, reading to be adopted on July 1st, uh, July 21st, and um, and as part of uh, our, our commitment to make sure that we'll stay on top of this and to make sure that uh, it gets regulated properly, that we will report back to City Council with the progress report um, six months after implementation. So with that, that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to um, try to answer any questions. And I also have um, on the other line is uh, Greg McLean who knows lots of the details of the um, ordinance. And so we'll be, we'll be happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Council, any comments or questions? Yes, Council Member Perstuck, then Council Member Nickel. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, I do have one question. Is there a way, at, so I know you said you come back in six months, but is there a way on our website that we could put a, um, a button or a, you know, a, way, a place for somebody, if there is any issues with any um, homestays, that they have a, a resource to go to quickly and we could see that quite immediate? So, because six months is a long time and I would hate for people to get frustrated that their voice isn't being heard quickly. So I would like to, um, that we put out there somewhere like in the whole you know in the explanation of our ordinance that there's actually a comment place where people could submit if they have any issues or concerns or even opportunities for change or just ex great experiences but gives give give our residents an opportunity to have a voice so that we can receive that information quickly and turn and make action about with that information quickly You mean to um, say that it'll be um, kind of a reading board for all, all to read, or we have a report it uh, process where they can report it and we respond, um, we, we keep track of it and we keep a log of every um, a report it that comes in through our website. Yeah, and, but yeah. it, 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 on that reporting, report it though, can we just then have a segment where it can go to for like for uh, home sharing? So that we it's ice like it's isolated i don't want i don't yeah. think people need to see all the comments but at least that the residents know that they have a place to go and um and propose their opportunities or their grievances or their successes yes we, we can absolutely create a separate category for home sharing short-term rental that's a great idea thank you yes councilman nickel uh, Mr. Lee, please refresh my memory because we've talked about this a few different times. Uh, I want to say this is my, might be the fourth time that this item has come before us. Uh, I do not recall, and I could be wrong, so I apologize if I am, but removing the home sharing in the R2 and the R3 zone, uh, if you you own a duplex and you want to rent out a room in your house, you, you live in the front house, you want to rent out a room, the way this ordinance is written, that is not allowable 
correct? Yes. So that's um, that's why I, I, I pointed it out. Um, the way it uh, was introduced before in prior um, consideration for council, um, we had it. Uh, I remember a time when we considered um, allowing it even in R three zones in multifamily uh, buildings, and um, and we had a stipulation that um, uh, even in multifamily buildings in R three zones. If you can show that you are the primary owner of that multifamily building, then you will be able to do it in, in that unit. Um, we felt that that was really hard to regulate. Um, and so we felt that, um, but we also knew that in some R2 and R3 zones, we have some R3 zones where it's developed as a single family home. And if they wanted to do the same thing as uh, same, same type of use as a, an R1 zone with a single family home, we felt that that should be allowed, but um, um, staff feels and, and council can give us uh, direction otherwise. But we thought that um, allowing in multifamily uses buildings would be would be difficult to uh, regulate and enforce. So we, we made it simpler um, to to say that if it was developed as a single family dwelling, that um, it, it would be allowed. Otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be. I understand the uh, the concern with trying to enforce it. I just feel that um, you know many times it's staff's job, unfortunately, to uh, decipher the will of the council mm -hmm. and what exactly the council was hoping for. And I think I thought that we were fairly clear in regards to we're okay with home sharing because we believe that those who are sharing their homes are more likely to self-regulate than having us to, to regulate because they, they are essentially sharing their home. They're opening up their door. They're under the same roof as the individual they're sharing the home with. Uh, and I just, I feel that, you know, item 11 B and C, it kind of goes against, I think what the will of the council was at that vote. I mean, I, I would rather us, it, this is a pilot program. It's a pilot program where if there are issues, you can come back to us and we can bring this back and we can alter it as we go. I just think making that um, not allowable at this time, I, I just think that's us assuming there's going to be an issue prior to there being an issue. I see uh, Mr. McLean on the call now. Yeah, I can explain why that, why that change was made. Um, Sam, can you turn on your speaker? Um, your microphone. The, re the reason, sorry, we got a feedback problem here. Hold on a second. Okay. We understood the will of the council at the time um, when we were dealing with all short-term rentals <clears throat> because it originated from a um, constituent that owned a um, duplex and he wanted to rent out the other, the other unit. unit. And, so, and so it was pretty clear to us at the time. and. We, we um, included it in the other versions of the ordinance. However, when we switched over to a home share only, it became obvious that um, that was gonna be a problem for us because, well, that guy wouldn't be able to do it for one thing, but also um, when you have a duplex under one ownership, it would be impossible for us to, to discern which unit was being used as a, as a, um, as a rental simply because the owner would say, I, you know, I do own this, uh, this duplex and I do reside in this duplex, but there's no way for us to know which one would be rented. That's the reason why we took this, this change into consideration. Um, I understand that your, your intent was to allow duplexes, but unless they're condos, this would not be a, anything that we could possibly regulate and it created a huge loophole. And then furthermore, um, it creates a slippery slope problem for us as well, because then it begs the question, well, what about somebody who owns a triplex and then a quad, a quadplex or whatever and so forth? So the simple solution for the duration of the pilot program was to limit it to single family homes. Um, so we understood your, your, um, your intent, but you'll have to um, forgive us. But when we went to home share only, we thought that that was a moot point. I want to build on that, Mr. Nickel, if I can. I, I guess I'm having a hard time discerning 
with now, I don't know, 30, 80, I don't know what the number of ADUs are. There are more being built. I'm sure there will be more being built as people realize what a good opportunity that is. How you discern an R2, which in many cases are, are very similar, like there are blocks where there's two single family homes separated by a pool or a yard on the same property that is effectively structurally the same thing as an ADU, more or less. The exception that maybe the ADU is limited to 1,200 feet. So I guess I don't understand the difference with that program, Mr. Nickel. Uh, so the, when the state law changed, the ADUs cannot be used for short-term rentals. Anyone getting an ADU permit? No, I get that, but you could live in the ADU. Fine. Yeah, you could live in the ADU, and you could, you know, I just it, it ways around that too. Again, if we try to discern every possible loophole and assume that there's going to be the rule breakers versus the rule followers i think we're we're heading into this in the wrong fashion we got rid of whole home rentals and went with the home sharing uh i would rather react to a problem than assume that there's going to be a problem i think that uh one of the one of the goals originally when we spoke about this is that and i, I think i made the statement that I never want to, with a regulation, change the value of someone's property, right? So what we're saying with this is if you own an R2 property, so, you know, with a single family home in the front and, a, and say a two bedroom rental in the back, you can't short term rent a bedroom in your front house that you live in. That's what we're saying. Even though you can prove you live there, you can go through the permit. No, you're shaking your head, Greg. No, I disagree. Um, you can have an R2 property. If you have a single family home and a detached unit on the back, you still have a single family home. If you live in that unit and if you own that property, you qualify. But your staff, your staff is going to see that when you search the property, the property's use code is going to say duplex. And then it's. Uh, no, but no, that doesn't matter. The, the municipal code define, or doesn't define a duplex. So we'll go by the common definition, which is with just two attached units. Okay, so to be clear then, just so I understand this, because the way it reads is if I own a duplex, I cannot participate in this program. You, you can, you can. Um, so if, yes, if you if you have an attached duplex, you cannot. So Scott, if I if I read you correctly, and if it's the will of the council, uh, we that's a, a minor change we can make. Um, we can allow it in, um, you, we can allow short-term rental home sharing in duplexes as well as multifamily dwellings. And the only thing we need to do is to verify that they're the owner of the, of the property, owner of the, of the building and we can end the unit. And we could, we could make that change and, uh, um, and include it in for the, the second reading if it's the will of the council and that's the direction you give us. That's the will of this council member. <laughs> Mr. Hensley has something. Mark. I just want to make, for clarification purposes, the um, council member Nickel, you would like to see if there's an R2 property and the owner is occupying one of the units that the unit that is occupied by the owner can be used for home sharing. The other unit would not be eligible for short-term rental or home sharing. It would just be the one that is occupied by the owner. Okay. I understand that that will be potentially difficult to regulate from staff, but again, I'd rather us come back to you and say, we have a problem. Let's make adjustments, then assume that there's going to be a problem and immediately cut out an entire subsect of, uh, of our housing element. Councilmember Giroux. So obviously I know this has been come this come up what four or five different meetings and my first one on this. I was in the audience for a lot of them. So I got a few questions and and the first one is who are we really trying to protect on this? From what well, my, my understanding is is that who we're trying to protect is the the homeowner who maybe now has an empty nest, um, has on a fixed income and they use that property their home to rent out to, to help make ends meet that, that was kind of one of the impressions i got on that if that's indeed the case 
then these other elements that we're concerning ourselves with don't really fall into that category. So are we protecting the business piece of it or protecting the resident piece of it? That's, I guess, where I'm, I'm having a little bit of confusion on that. Well, why would you assume, uh, Lance, that someone couldn't be an empty nester with an R2? Like, my whole block is R2s where there are mm -hmm. people that have a rental in the back. They bought this right. property. They paid more for it when R2s were effectively worth more money. <clears throat> They've actually gotcha. degraded okay. now what they'd used. Then kids leave the house. We still have a tent in the back, potentially, right? You paid, by the way, you paid a lot more for that R2, but you're still living in the front house. You don't need all that space in the front house. And maybe, you know, you got a four bedroom house or whatever it is, five bedroom house. You might want that flexibility too. So I think it's the same set of circumstances, just a little bit of a nuanced property. Yeah, house, I think. Okay. So then my next thanks, thanks for the clarification on that. So I guess one big question I got, and Mr. Mitnick, if you're on the line here, what is it going to cost us to run the pilot? There has to be a cost attached to it. What is it? Is it 20 grand? Is it 40 grand? Maybe, maybe I can answer that question. Go ahead. So, um, you know, the, um, you know, we've never done this before. So it's, it was based on a number of assumptions and, um, uh, we put a range of, uh, of number of people we feel, you know, we guessed that uh, they'll come in and pull a permit. Um, we, we thought that range would be from 30 to 50 uh, permits. And um, based on that, um, we put some assumptions on the number of nights, cost per night. And uh, we figure that, um, that there will be a revenue side of, um, um, I think it was, uh, Thirty-six to uh, sixty thousand dollars. On the cost side, uh, on the cost side, we put a number of uh, forty thousand dollars. About thirty thousand dollars of it will go to a uh, consultant that will monitor the internet activity for short-term rentals for us. The um, the other ten thousand would go to. Um, we thought that there would be some opportunities for code enforcement to work on weekends and on overtime. And um, and based on those assumptions, uh, and if, if all of the other assumptions are correct, um, it shouldn't cost the, the city any funds. Um, we we should um, we should be we be ahead if if if, um, if we should be even if if we're if we're not a little ahead. So the the cost is forty grand. Yeah, and we have the potential to make that back, and we feel. Worst case scenario, we should be right at what we what we expended. Yeah, our assumptions are right. Gotcha. And the last piece I have is, do we have the ability, flat and manpower to to actually enforce what the pilot program is? Because last time I checked, I think we only have one code enforcement officer. Is that right? Yes, but um, this so do we feel confident as an organization that it could work? Because I'm all for doing a pilot program if it has a chance to survive and succeed. If it doesn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, maybe I can answer that question as well. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, now, you know, it's um, the enforcement of it is a um, multi-departmental um, activity. Um, you know, uh, there, it'll be police departments involved, code enforcement's involved, and, and our finance department's involved in the uh, collection of taxes and fees and whatnot. And uh, mind you, um, we have received, uh, you know, numerous complaints about a specific um, short-term rental um, activity in the city. Uh, we have not received any complaints, and I believe there are people in the community that use um, short-term rental for home sharing. We have not received any complaints about home sharing short-term rental. So right. I'm hopeful that the um, we won't get um, a lot of complaints, but um, certainly if we do, um, we will report that in our uh, six month, if you'd like for us to be there um, earlier, we can certainly do that, but we will report to council on a regular basis of how we're doing on a number of permits, number of complaints, number of uh, revocations, and how we're doing uh, financially. Okay, and the last thing I got, and then I'll be quiet on this, because I know you guys are, have been doing it for a while, is that you on the slide you have R1, R2, R3. I, my, uh, my impression is we're talking R1 and R2. Are we also talking R3? or is in special circumstances. Well, yeah, so so we wrote down R1, R2, and R3, and this is this is different than the way council is directing us tonight, and, and, and I'll, I'll summarize what, what the council is uh, giving us direction to do to, to tonight. 
and we'll read that into the record. But the way the ordinance is written is that, um, you know, you can have a, um, you, you know, single family homes are built on R1, but we have single family homes that are built on R2 and R3. So the, the way the ordinance is written is that if you have a single family dwelling on an R3 zone, you should still be allowed to do it. Okay. Now, council has given us direction, and if you vote for this change, that we will allow um, in R1, R2, and R3, and in single-family dwelling, duplex, and multifamily single uh, multifamily dwellings, as long as the, the the resident living in that unit is the is the owner of that property, we will allow, we will issue the permit, and they will be allowed to do uh, short-term rental home sharing. Hey uh, Sam, I know I'm Mr. Hensley, apartment complexes. Mr. Right. Hensley, I think Mr. Hensley has been dying to raise his hand. Are we in are oh. we in trouble with water or what's no, going no, on? No, 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 no. I I just um, there was a question asked, and it was the second to last question asked asked by Councilmember Jeru, and that is the enforcement issue. Uh, the enforcement of the home sharing is probably relatively minor relative to what could be enforcement of the number of short-term rentals that are occurring in the city. If we are going to proactively start um, code enforcement with regard to the short-term rentals in the city, and there are probably lots of them, um, that will be, um, that will take a lot of staff resources and, and, and time. The demand, I believe, based upon what I've seen is, is not for home sharing. The larger demand is for the short-term rentals. And if we're going to curb that activity, that will take a fair amount of, of time and effort. So just to respond to that part of it. Uh, on the R3, not all R3 units are uh, rentals. That is, we have some condominium projects in the city. So when the council gives direction on whether or not R3 properties can be subject to home sharing, the question I would have also is, so if it's a condominium project and the home, there may, let's say there's 20 units and they're all occupied by the property owner, are all of those units, uh, is the intention that all those units could be used for home sharing? Trying to understand, so you're saying a condominium complex one owner owns every single condominium in the complex no it's an apartment building is generally owned by one person or one entity or maybe a, a group of people but condominium projects each unit is generally owned by a different individual so is the intent for a condominium project in r3 that each one of those units that separately owned could be used for show, home sharing believe the discussion we had as a council was apartment buildings were a hard no condominium complexes we left that to the individual hoas if they wanted to restrict it and or um set any guidelines within their bylaws uh because we did have people come to us and say hey why are you excluding home sharing from a condo complex if i own a, a two or three bedroom condo and i want to rent out one of my rooms short term that should be my right so long as my hoa allows for it but the council was a hard no on apartment buildings for the um, under the pretense that that was where we were trying to eliminate the commercialization of this, uh, where someone would come in, rent out an entire apartment building and then turn it into a small hotel. Correct me if I'm wrong, my fellow council people. No, that sounds right. <clears throat> but there is a limit. What's the limit, Sam, in terms of number of people? Is it two people per room? I can't yes. remember. Yes. Two. So it's somewhat limited in terms of physical constraints but so so what I, i'm hearing I, is then then limit the um the home sharing to uses of single family dwelling and um primary resident of the owner of the duplex then is that right not allowed in multifamily buildings um including condominiums yeah i see everybody nodding on that one wait um, I'm sorry, I, I thought Council Member Nichols said to allow it in condominium projects. Oh, did he? Hey, the primary residence. Right. If it's their primary residence right. and it's a two bedroom unit, I oh, should Oh, that's be not what Sam just said, Scott. Yeah. That's okay. 
And I so, what, so if the majority of the council wants to allow home sharing in R2 and R3, if the property, if it's the property owners in the unit, in the residential unit, so long as it's the, uh, the owner, it's their primary residence, then if the majority of the council wants to do that, when you get to the point of reading the ordinance, I will read into the record some changes to uh, the ordinance on that point. Okay, where's where's the council on that? I, I concur with Mr. Nickel. Lance, you yeah, yes. Okay, Carol. Yes. I'm I am a hard no on the apartment complexes and then leave it up to the HOAs to determine for their con for the condominium. For the for con okay, yeah. I think we're all saying the same thing on that one, right? Yeah. Apartments okay. out, but condominium buildings subject to HOA approval and they can prove that it's the primary owner. Mark, what's wrong? No, I'm, I'm just listening. I think practically speaking, and either Sam or Greg McLean might be able to respond to this um, better than I can, but I suspect that with the parking requirements that it will be very difficult for a condominium owner to meet the parking requirements to have home sharing. But that will be, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we don't have to say anything about the homeowners association if they have rules that allow it or don't allow it, that will be between the unit Private owner park. and the HOA. Okay. Great. I think you have direction. Thank you. Thanks so, for all your years of perseverance, Mark, Sam, Greg, everybody. So on section, on, on page seven of the ordinance, uh, towards the bottom, there's a capital B home sharing in the R2 zone. So that would be home sharing is permitted at a property. Home sharing is permitted in the residential unit. That is the primary residence, residence of the property owner. And that same change would be made to C below okay. um, in the R3. And Mark, okay. Mark, before we even continue from a process standpoint, um, I know that the clerk had some letters to read some public comments. Wait. Yep. Can you check your script though, Drew? I think we need to. Yeah, um, we heard the presentation. Public hearing is now open for public input and city clerk has written communication been received regarding this public hearing. Yes. Thank you. Um, and um, Mona in in chamber, or do you have anyone there to either? I'll read why you, why she comes on. Um, this is from Elaine Rock. Short term income is essential for some of us seniors to remain in our El Segundo home. Inflation has created hardships for residents who bought property many years ago and never dreamed the cost of living would be so unbelievably high to the point of unaffordable short term brings in much needed income for property owners and local businesses. Thank you for listening, Elaine Hopkins. And the second one I received, this is, um, unfortunately, I don't have a name on this one, but I will read it. I am a homeowner for 21 years and an Airbnb house here in El Segundo for short term rentals, hosting only two people at a time. It is affordable way. It is a affordable way for travelers to visit El Segundo and support the local stores and restaurants. I am a widow, and this is how I am able to pay my mortgage. And we received a letter um, from Ms. Eisman, but she spoke during um, public comments, and it, it, it's the same sentiment. But I can read it to you if you would like me to. Uh, yeah, I think we should. Please, thank you. Um, let's see. Very happy El Segundo has decided to proceed with responsible home sharing. Proactive, effective enforcement requires clear black and white regulations while provo providing financial opportunity for home share hosts and still protecting community residents' neighborhoods. Property owner and city are responsible for managing compliance, not the neighbors. Property owner live on site throughout visitors stay requirement is critical especially when a complaint is responded to host must be present or available in town 
property owner primary residence for 183 nights. Great. What proof will be required? Who will be responsible for managing this very important requirement? Beware of ghost hosts. Occupancy limitation. Hosts must allow police, city staff, entry to property to count the number of people in all rooms at the time of request. Parties, events, are now gatherings. Cities stay current on new marketing tactics to avoid city guidelines. ADU and garage prohibitions on short-term rental, thank you. Key to compliance is enforcement, issuing fines. Thank you, Mona Eisman. And that's all I have. Thank you. Tracy, um, there's no one here from uh, the public. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do I have a motion to close the public hearing? If so, please state your last name. Nichols, so moved. Giroux, second. Okay. Thank you. All right. Madam Clerk, roll, roll call vote, please. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Giroux? Aye. Council Member Nichol? Aye. Council Member Perstock? Aye. Uh, Mr. Pemintel is in the waiting room. Mayor Boyles? Yes. So closing 4 0. Great. And then, City Attorney, um, would you want to do you want to read the ordinance by title only? Or have we already accomplished that earlier? Uh, do you need a motion to introduce? I, I will. First, yes, sir. After this, I'll, I'll read the title and then it'll be ready for an introduction. Okay. An ordinance of the City of El Segundo amending Title IV parenthetical business regulations and licensing in the parenthetical of the El Segundo Municipal Code by adding a new chapter establishing regulations for short-term home sharing rentals and amending Title 15 zoning regulations allowing short-term home sharing in city's residential zones through a short-term home sharing permit pilot program is ready for introduction. Councilman Nickel, would you like to introduce? Councilman Nickel, I would like to introduce. Okay, second reading adoption is scheduled for July 21st, 2020. Great, thank you. All right, uh, item, well, D, staff presentations, item nine, authorized city manager, manager to execute a professional services agreement with Nithin Incorporated for $130,000 to provide a site analysis, needs assessment, community engagement, schematic concept design, and final recommendations for the Urosari Swim Stadium, aka the Plunge 219 West Mariposa Avenue. Mr. Mitnick. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Are you bringing Mariposa back in the fold? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who controls that anyway? <laughs> Is that you, Trace? Thank you. Sorry, uh, Chris. All right. Thanks, Lance. Yeah, thank you, Lance. I don't see him yet. You have me? I hear you. There we go. All right. See you. There you go. Okay, Mr. Mitnick, back to you. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, this is your last item on the agenda, and this is seeking authorization for the design work to proceed for the plunge pool. We have Meredith Pettit, our uh, rec and park director, and Mark Watkins, our interim public works director, uh, ready to. Um, uh, Meredith will start with the presentation. Mark will be ready too, and then to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Just momentarily, I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> All right. I trust that you all can see the presentation. Uh, just a real brief uh, presentation. Um, this evening, we are seeking the city council's approval to enter into a professional services agreement with the selected architectural design team, Mithun, is how you pronounce it, in, amount, in an amount of $130,000 to help the city determine the design scope for the future renovation of the Eurosari Swim Stadium. Uh, also known as our beloved plunge. And just for context, uh, the plunge is located at 219 West Mariposa Avenue. Uh, it's over 80 years old now. It was a WPA project in the late 
1930s and opened in 1940. It's a fully enclosed natatorium style uh, with a full uh, enclosure with a ceiling. Uh, it has a lobby uh, as you enter, uh, locker rooms, both male and female, offices, upstairs and storage space. Uh, it does have two pools. A lot of people don't know that or think that, but it does have uh, one 25 meter by eight lane pool and a smaller uh, teaching pool. And on both sides, there are spectator seating. Uh, the facility is suitable for small competitive swimming competitions uh, and was used for this purpose for many years. Uh, but with the opening of the El Segundo Wiseburn Aquatic Center, the plunge uh, has a future ahead of it uh, to be used for a wider range of recreational programming uh, that could include uh, lap swimming for adults, uh, an enhanced group swim lesson program, um, senior programming, fitness classes, therapy and rehab, uh, pre-competition swim, swim team activities and family activities as well. Uh, we believe that with modernization, the plunge will continue to have great utility and uh, a long life ahead of it, a second life, if you will, uh, as a community recreational pool. So the future renovation of the facility will consider many factors, including modernizing the mechanical systems. I always like to show these photos here. Uh, if anybody's never been back, if the council's never been back into the boiler and filter room, I highly recommend taking a tour. Um, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, so we'll be looking for better reliability and more efficiency in keeping the pool temperature steady uh, and the water chemistry um, at the proper levels. Uh, building and health codes, including accessibility, will be addressed, as will program considerations and best practices. Uh, as to what the, the use of the facility will be moving forward. Uh, we'll be looking at reducing annual operating costs and long-term maintenance expenses. Uh, also various types of pool and deck solutions can be considered uh, and certainly we'll be paying close attention to uh, maintaining the historical uh, significance of this building. Uh, this particular phase is actually, I know we've been talking about renovation of the plunge for a long time um, before I even came to the city almost a decade ago. I know it's been a dream of a lot of community members and we're getting closer and closer, which is really exciting. But uh, the reality is this is sort of the initial phase. Uh, this is the concept design process. Um, and for this process, we released a request for proposals in February uh, and received 11 proposals uh, by the due date at the end of March. Uh, the selection committee was comprised of uh, recreation and parks and public works staff, as well as two, um, two of our members of the recreation and parks commission who make up our aquatic subcommittee. Uh, we ranked the proposals, the top three were invited to interview and there was a unanimous decision to uh, seek the services of Methoon and aquatic design group. Uh, they've collaborated uh, to be a team on this project, uh, both of which are well-known and accomplished firms. Uh, their scope of work basically ends in a concept design and schematics that would be presented to city council. And uh, the process would include site analysis and assessment, community engagement, a needs assessment, and, um, and then the final concept design options for the city council to consider moving forward. Uh, this next slide lays out the overall project phases uh, and uh, Mark Watkins, our interim public works director, uh, will elaborate on what to expect moving forward in the process. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, Mayor Boyles, the rest of the city council, I'll go through very briefly only because Meredith covered it in quite a bit of detail there. Uh, but this project will kind of lay out what the future of the plunge is gonna be. You'll see that some of the dates we have on here are very broad. We're just kind of looking at years in general. Uh, and that's because, you know, until you have the option done, it's really hard to know exactly what the scope of work will be. Uh, but the important thing is to look at the funding. So right now, the three and a half million that's allocated in the capital program, that includes a million dollars that was pledged in this fiscal year. But that's also anticipating two and a half million 
in the next two fiscal years. So a million dollars next fiscal year and a million and a half the year after. And so those construction dates kind of align with when that funding comes together. There's also an agreement with the uh, school district for a million dollars, a grant from Chevron and the potential for some fundraising from South State Sports. Um, but at this point, a million or $5 million has, has been set aside or has been programmed and is planned for. Uh, once this initial phase is done, uh, we expect the council will be presented with various options and those options being from a simple approach, uh, which would probably be the least expensive, which is just kind of taking care of the mechanical and electrical and the systems, uh, and some of the structural up to uh, uh, whatever else the community is interested in. So through those outreach and, and community meetings, uh, we'll find out whether there's other interests that are there and um, and whether they're uh, in the affordable range and put some cost to those and bring those back to council also. Uh, but for now, this first phase will take us through the end of this year and early into 2021. And at that point in time, we'll be able to come to council, uh, present some conceptual ideas, uh, some funding for those, and then council will have the information it needs, needs to make a decision and go for it. Uh, so with that, we're ready to answer any questions. Okay. Colleagues, questions, comments? No, I just want to um, commend you, Meredith, and your team for moving forward on this. I know we've been, I, I know I personally have been really pushing hard to get this started, and you have been able to get this done during this whole COVID process. So I really commend you for doing that. And I'm just happy to see that it's on the schedule and that we have a tentative live date of September 2022. So thank you very much for doing that. And I'm just really pleased to see it's moving forward. Thank you. All right, looks like we are, I don't see much activity. So <clears throat> we need to authorize city manager to do this. Do I have a motion? Yes. First tick, so moved. Okay. Pim until second. Okay, Mayor, I mean, <laughs> Madam Clerk. Council Member Giroux? Yes. Council Member Nichol? Aye. Council Member Perstock? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel? Yes. Mayor Boyles? Yes. All right, you passed 5 0. All right, great. That concludes the regular part of the agenda, and we're going to move on to reports from the City Clerk. I think I've done enough speaking tonight. You're good. <laughs> Thank you for doing all that speaking. Uh, city Treasurer. I don't think they're on. Okay, Council Member Drew. Uh, nothing for this evening. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Council Member Nickel. I just want to thank staff for all their hard work uh, recently uh, through everything that's going on from one uh, one emergency to another and. Um, I feel like staff has done a fabulous job listening to the community, reacting to the community, uh, reacting to our requests. Um, Scott, I just want to commend you and your staff for all the hard work you do. And I just want them to know how much we appreciate their efforts. And to our community, I just want to thank you all for being so respectful to each other. Uh, continue to lead with kindness during this time as we come out of um, these different phases of the pandemic. Please just respect each other's individual choices. Uh, let's try to be slow to judge and uh, and quick to kindness. Uh, same goes for any kind of peaceful protesting going on. Understand that one of the beautiful things of living in a community is uh, diversity. Diversity of uh, our skin color, our backgrounds, our ethnicities, our thoughts, our political opinions. Uh, these are all things that we as Americans have the freedom um, to express. And uh, I just hope that our community continues to uh, accept those uh the diversity of thought with welcome welcome minds so thank you mr boyles thank you councilmember nickel all right uh councilmember first up thank you um scott nickel for your words i i do want to re reiterate that kindness is important it's important to be kind to everybody and respect everybody's views and tolerance you know is it's a tolerance for everybody so Thank you and thank you to the staff for everything you do. And I do want to give a shout out to all the, the graduates that have uh, from El Segundo High School, Weisburn High School, from Bistamar, as well as Rena, and then our uh, middle school kids being promoted. 
and our um, Richmond and Center Street schools kids, the culmination for those kids. So congratulations to everyone and I hope you all have the best success in the future. Thank you, Councilmember Perstek. Mayor Pro Tem Pimentel. Uh, a few items of note for some regional developments. Uh, it's important for the public to be mindful uh, when they receive some emails that look a bit spammy about developments on I-105. Uh, there will be public comment periods on the potential transition of the HOV lane to a paid express lane in the manner of the 110. Uh, importantly, if you have a carpool, you can still use it for free, just like the 110, but you likely would have to register with a transponder. Public comment on those changes from Metro is going forward. Again, that's not a City of El Segundo program. That's a regional program but it is a matter of import that affects our residents and people who work here. Uh, also, I, I don't want to undersell that our progress on North Nash Street and the Nash Street extension is moving ahead. Uh, and that is a big regional development involving our transportation piece of the reapportionment of transpo funds. Um, so those are the two big ones. I know Mr. Mayor, you'll look forward to our exciting sanitation meeting this week uh, for district five. There's one thing we like talking about, it's solid waste. Uh, and uh, other than that, I just to echo the sentiments of, uh, of the fellow councilmen about the importance of, of being able to look at what the other side is arguing because we all tend to mean well uh, and thank everyone for the humanity and humility with which they've done it. Thank you, Mayor Potem. I'll be brief. I think you just reminded me that we all serve in committees, commissions and boards. And I don't know if that's common knowledge for our constituents and one of the things we talked about recently is that we should do a try to do a better job as a council to report back to each other and to the public about all the different things we're involved with mayor pro tem you know you talked about things that are coming out of the south bay cog transportation committee thank you for your leadership there and so we're going to each one of us are assigned to these different committees commissions and boards so hopefully by the next meeting mr mitnick we can start incorporating some of those report back to um, to each other and to the public at large. So thank you for that reminder. Mayor Pro Tem, City Attorney, anything to report this evening? Nothing this evening, Mayor and Council, thank you. All right, City Manager. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, uh, no additional follow-up to comments made uh, th throughout the agenda and um, nothing in addition to what we already uh, committed to do. Um, I would like to um, well, first, thank you, Council, for the, uh, the, the recognition of, of your staff's hard work during these two emergencies. I, I would like to turn that around and say thank you to the City Council. We appreciate your support, indulgence, and patience as we deal with these uh, somewhat unprecedented challenges. And I, I, I'd like to reassure the viewers that this, this governing board is exceptionally responsive to its constituents and the demands uh, that they place on us as staff to make sure the community and both the residential community and the business community is up to speed and aware of what we're doing. Um, uh, I haven't worked for a governing board that's been uh, this insistent on it. And I mean that in a complimentary way. I'm really proud of the level of service and the enhancements we've made on our website and our communication mechanisms, mechanisms and so on. I know this is really hard for our business community. Uh, earlier today, the mayor and I were having lunch at a local restaurant and the owner of that restaurant was sharing the challenges with the um, uh, inability to be open fully and uh, we I like to make a plug for our residents to get out there and support these local restaurants and retailers uh, do what you can and in, in as comfortable a manner as you feel to be out there and, and to support them so your next uh, meeting at this point council is on July 22nd that will be uh, the proposed uh, budget study session and follow up on the short-term rental item we may actually have a meeting before then uh, to be responsive to issues that, that pop up. And we're also working on the strategic plan for the, the next year. We will roll into that strategic plan, the diversity uh, um, uh, goal that we talked about. So we will make sure that's in there uh, front and center. Uh, that's it, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, thank you for a good meeting. Councilor first up. I just wanna make one big um, push to, if you haven't done your census to please complete it. I know we are at 77%. Um, compared to the average 62%. You know, it's important that we, you know that for every registrant, we get $1,000 from the government. So that census calculation is real important to be completed. So please 
please, if you haven't done it, take the time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Perstuk. All right, we are adjourned at 8.36 p.m. Have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>